Hi, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Discovering Multifamily podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Anthony Scandariato with Red Knight Properties. And today we have a special guest here with us, Rob Beardsley, and he's the founder and principal at Lone Star Capital. He's also an author and a speaker at Lone Star. He oversees acquisitions and capital markets and has acquired over $100 million in multifamily real estate. And for those of you who are watching the video, you can see that Rob's a very young guy and he's 24 years old and has already had the experience of acquiring $100 million of multifamily real estate opportunities. Today on the show, we're going to talk about how he's evaluated, evaluated thousands of opportunities in order to get to that type of assets under management through different underwriting models. And he actually published the number one book on multifamily underwriting, which is called The Definitive Guide to Underwriting multifamily acquisitions. So we're going to talk about the fundamentals of underwriting, maybe get into some ways of structuring your deal. And we're very excited to have him on the show. So thanks for coming on, Rob. Yeah, thank you very much. Great. So can you talk to us about what this guide is? Is it for, is it for newbies? Is it for intermediate, advanced? What skill level should people read the book at? So I would say a couple of things. The book is a really A to Z guide to uh, underwriting multifamily acquisitions. So the, the beginner could read it, but probably would find a lot of gaps in their knowledge, but which is fine because then that would inspire them to go and kind of fill those gaps through various other means. I mean, so the book doesn't really start from the very beginning of your journey as far as what's a cap rate and things like that. Right, it picks up a little more, um, a little more advanced. But I still, I think people from from absolute beginners to fairly intermediate have, uh, you know, praised the book and have gotten a lot out of it. So that's been great to see. And then the other thing about it as well is, uh, I didn't write it just for, um, you know, aspiring or currently active sponsors. I also uh, wrote it strongly in mind for passive investors, because I felt that there, well, and I, I do continue to feel that there is an, an issue or a gap in the market for, for passive investors, as far as their uh, desire, willingness, ability to underwrite, right? It, I, I describe it as kind of like this black box that passive investors feel that they shouldn't cross that line. And then they just leave the numbers up to the experts. And I disagree and think that underwriting, you know, especially through my simple 100 page book can be made accessible to everyone and uh, passive investors should absolutely be underwriting the deals that they're contemplating investing in. So that was the two, two ideas behind the book. A hundred percent agree with that. So how do you break it down for the passive investor in terms of comparing their underwriting model from a sponsor? And there's many different models that different sponsors use. How can they easily transpose that into your passive investor model? so they can understand the way that they look at their Excel models versus the way the sponsor does? Yeah, that's a great question because like you said, there's thousands of models out there and they all do the same thing, but they all do it in slightly different ways. And so what I recommend is whether you're an active or a past investor that you pick one model and use it consistently. So, you know, never would I or, or, or really anyone should just take a model and it, as is and say, okay, great, these are the numbers because the, the model could be completely accurate, but just the way that it's constructed could project returns in a slightly different way than you're used to. And so by always bringing the numbers into your model, it's going to more, uh, you know, compare apples to apples. And that's what we're looking for. Right? At the end of the day, you know, yes, we focus a lot on the numbers. For example, you know, we want to get a 15% IRR or something like that but they're all relative. So if your model just happens to be more conservative and most of the deals that you underwrite come in at a 10% IRR, and then you plug in the numbers on the next deal and it comes in at 14 or 13, well, that's, that's the deal you should do. That's the better deal, assuming risks, risk is equal, right? So it's less about the numbers and more about the relative value. And you only can discern relative value through having lots of data points and, and you know repeating that underwriting process. So, so I recommend, um, investors pick a model and stick with it and then really come to understand it. So that way it speaks to them rather than just being kind of numbers on a page that they don't really know what they're looking at. 
Um, and as you know, there's only so many inputs in a model. It's not that they're going to have to spend, anyone has to spend all day transposing uh, what's, what's in an existing model, right? You just bring over the rents, bring over the expenses, bring over the, the growth assumptions, the exit cap rate, the financing, and then partnership structure. And so it's not, it's not a 10 minute thing, but you know, it shouldn't be all day. Definitely takes some time. And, and I would say that the good thing about multifamily as an asset class from a passive investor standpoint, and even an active investor, is it's, it's, it's a simple concept to grasp, no matter where you are in, in the risk profile of the multifamily property, whether it's ground up's a little bit different, that's going to be a different model, right? Do you have models yes. for that? Or you're, do you only have models for you know, existing cash flow, income producing properties that have the ability to you know, capture equity through value add enhancements over a time period? Yeah, our model is uh, refined to for that use case for for value add existing multifamily. Uh, you know, we have in a pinch used it for special situations, including development, but it's uh, it's really not suited for it. We plan on getting involved in development, uh, hopefully in the next year, and at that point in time, we'll definitely build a a brand new model for development. Yeah, so it's very different and. You know, what I was getting at as well is for multifamily, it's a lot different if you're underwriting an office building, right? Because office buildings have special programs like Argus that sponsors use and they can export it to their own Excel and a lot more going on with even office and hotels, a lot more going on, industrial, different leases. So your model, is it an Excel model that pretty much, like you said, is accessible for active and passive investors to easily use without spending thousands of dollars on fancy software. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So nothing special about my model, just a simple Excel spreadsheet. And there's many great models out there. And, you know, for the multifamily space, like you said, most of the time they're in Excel and some are more complex than others. But for me, when I set out to create my model and have refined it over, you know, 200 hours of iteration, I didn't set out to build the most complicated model or the necessarily the most robust model. Uh, what I wanted to do is strike a balance between the fewest amount of inputs for the most amount of information and accuracy. So uh, how, how do we rate, retain robustness while not overloading the inputs process? And so that's, that's what I really did and was you know, very judicious with wanting to layer in additional inputs. You know, how can I, yeah, how can I, do the whole underwriting while only inputting the least amount. So, so that's kind of the, one of the reasons why uh, so many people love my model because it's so simple yet makes a lot of sense. It's easy to read and the inputs are all on one tab. So you don't get lost kind of thinking, well, should I change this number over there? It's keeping it all, 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 uh, all together. And then uh, just kind of a plug real quick for anybody who's interested, you can download our model for free on our website, lscre.com. So I recommend everybody download it, check it out. Uh, there's no, there's no password. You can tinker with it. You can unlock it, break it down, make it your own. So I, uh, I love that we've been able to build a community in some ways around the model. And I get random emails from people saying, Hey, I found a bug, you know, you need to fix this. And so we kind of, uh, crowdsourced the model, uh, you know, to improve it. Yeah, that's great. And, and I've had similar experiences. I actually haven't, I haven't checked out your model, but I would, would do so. But some others, um, I've seen some bugs, but they appreciate it. It's everybody's working together to get deals done. So when you point something out, it's not a big deal. Um, can you talk about a, a little bit more of high level for underwriting now? So what type of deals are you looking at? How are you tweaking your underwriting in the post-COVID environment? It's, we're recording this in the middle of August of 2021. So where, what locations are you looking at? And are you tweaking your rent assumptions? Uh, what's your thoughts on entry cap versus exit cap and yield to cost? Some of those just general you know, metrics. Yeah, sure. So, so getting a little more advanced, first I'll talk about the, the COVID adjustments that you mentioned, because that was what everybody wanted to talk about pretty much a year ago. So when COVID first hit, the the ways that we approach changing our model we wanted to change things that were temporary because we felt that the pandemic would be temporary and its effects on multifamily temporary so we didn't want to make 
uh, you know, permanent valuation uh, implications based on what was happening at the time. So what we did is we stressed going in vacancy, we stressed um, we stressed uh, stress going in vacancy, we stressed uh, collection loss. So kind of things that would happen in the first year or two years, and then we would ramp up or you know get back to normal on those things. So that is how we uh, underwrote. And honestly, looking back on it, we uh, we were too conservative. We really during COVID there was a very small window. There weren't a lot of transactions going on, but there was a small window to not buy anything at a discount, but just buy it at you know, an okay price, you know, that's, that's the problem. Everyone was hoping, you know, what's the COVID discount? Is it 5%, 10%? Oh, I'm going to wait until it's 20%, right? People really thought this and, you know, very smart investors, very uh, successful investors thought that we would see 10, 20% declines in multifamily value. But what ended up happening was the Fed lowered rates, you know, a lower discount rate inflated values further. And, and now we're sitting here with, I don't know, 10%, maybe five, 10% higher pricing. So it would have been a great time to pick up whatever inventory was on the market, uh, but we were too conservative. So, so that's the way it was. We didn't buy anything after COVID hit in 2020, um, unfortunately. But in 2021, we picked up and started kind of getting more in tune with the market and uh, were able to buy a couple deals. So, um, so that's kind of the COVID situation. The, then going to some of the more interesting stuff that you mentioned, which I get really excited about, which is talking about like yield on costs or, you know, and the spread of your yield on costs for your exit cap rate and things like that. So w one of the things that is interesting is there's always a discussion about, well, how many basis points are you widening your exit cap rate from your entry cap rate, right? If you're going in at a four and a half, you should exit to a five or something like that. But the, the reality is your entry cap really tells you very little doesn't necessarily tell you a lot about what the exit cap rate should be or what the market cap rate is to begin with. Because if somebody, for example, if we buy a property that's 70% occupied and has very low rents, we might pay a three cap for that property. But that three cap isn't indicative of the, the going rate for a stabilized asset. Because when you do a value add, you're fundamentally buying a certain type of asset and you're selling a different type of asset, right? You might be buying a value add and might be selling a stabilized and those have different cap rates. So that's why it's important to, to really know the market, talk to the brokers, follow the, follow the deal flow, and know what the prevailing cap rates are in the market based on what you're trying to sell, not what you're trying to buy. And then that's how we fine tune our exit cap rates. And so, you know, we, we sometimes, like we've seen deals where we're only widening the exit cap rate by 25 bips or maybe by 200 bips, just depending on the business plan and the going in yield. So, so that's, I think, uh, a good point for people to understand. Yes, and how, how do you look at rising interest rates? Obviously we're in a situation in the United States with inflation. So how do you foresee that affecting cap rates on multifamily two or three years from now, especially rates will rise. No matter, I don't know how much, probably not significant, but they're going to rise. So how do you end up forecasting uh, and adjusting for that as well in your underwriting moving forward? Yeah, so the, you know, there are studies that show that interest rates and cap rates are 70% correlated. So when, when interest rates are projected to go up, a lot of people start making the arguments, oh, well, interest rates and cap rates are uncorrelated, right? They start making that argument. But then when interest rates are falling, people now come out and say, oh, interest rates are falling and therefore cap rates are going to go down. So this is a great time to buy and all that stuff. So people kind of use that logic selectively, uh, you know, when it's in their favor. But as far as the data, it appears that it's about 70% correlated. So there's absolutely a correlation. So if we do see a material rise in interest rates, we should see an increase in cap rates. But the cap rates have a lot more factors going on than just interest rates. It's um, flow of funds. And there's a ton of money flowing to multifamily. Also, growth projections, right? People are going to be willing, to, people are willing to pay lower cap rates today, assuming great growth in the future, right? Take Phoenix, for example. People are willing to pay, you know, three caps and four caps all day long in Phoenix because rents just grew 20% in the last year, right? The joke is 
you put a three cap under contract and by the time you close it's a four cap because rents have already grown so much so uh so growth is a major factor for for what you know a, a cap rate should be so with all that being said i do agree with you that interest rates you know the, the consensus is interest rates will rise not a whole ton actually i was looking at the the uh forecasted 10-year treasury and it was something i forget what on what uh if i was looking two years out three years out but it was it was still under two percent the market consensus doesn't have the the tenure over two percent so that's just really you know about a 50 basis point move higher and um the the so you know i'm certainly not smart the smarter than the market and i'm not going to have a bet that is less or greater than what the market consensus is but the one point that i do want to add is that uh, with that 70% correlation to cap rates, in my opinion, if I were to make a bet, I would say that we have, um, as interest rates rise, I think the spread will absorb some of that move. So I don't think cap rates will move like this one-to-one. -one. I think interest rates will move a bit and then cap rates will move a little bit, but not on a one-to-one -one ratio. It'll lag because I think we actually have today a pretty favorable spread between cap rates and interest rates. And I think that spread is... Uh, has potential to tighten. Right, right. Yeah, you know, definitely interesting to look at where the treasury is at and what the forecast is for the future. Um, can you talk a little bit about some of the different partnership structures that you see out there nowadays? Is it, you know, when you're looking at larger multifamily deal, obviously there you know, a lot of them are syndicated, you know, you know meaning there are groups of investors partnering together to buy a large asset. What are you seeing nowadays and does your model help with projecting if there's a preferred return, if there's uh, what we like to call the promote, which for the GP and LP, the active and passive to split over a certain return. Uh, what are you seeing nowadays? Is, does your model account for that? Is it, is it easy to understand, especially if there's multiple hurdles uh, along the way? Um, can you talk about that aspect? Yeah, yeah, waterfalls are, are very important to be able to understand and model because as an investor, right, that, those, that has a real implication on what you actually take home, right? It doesn't really matter if the deal's a home run on a project level, if the partnership structure is set up in such a way that you only take a small piece. So, so partnership structure is very important and it does speak to alignment of interest between the investors and the sponsor and, uh, you know, kind of, what's fair and what's unfair and whatnot. So, you know, in our model, we absolutely, we can model in, uh, you know, pref or no pref. We can do multiple tiered structures and uh, things like that. So I guess kind of to take it a little bit to the next level, the the two big things that are we're seeing in the market today are, uh, well, maybe even three, but um, so the three things we're seeing, I think everything is coming down all all the numbers are coming down, right? It was, uh, you know, very standard to, to see an eight pref whenever it was, you know, three years ago. And now more and more we're seeing seven prefs. So that's creeping it down a bit. And that's just in response to uh, two things, I think. I think there's just a lot of demand from investors coming into the space. So sponsors are being able to dictate stronger terms for themselves, but also perspective returns are just coming down, right? With the reduction in interest rates and, and demand, there's just, uh, less potential return out there. So that's coming down. And then the what's interesting, I, I think this move has happened rather quickly is the uh, secondary hurdle. Not every deal has a tier two a hurdle. And for those who are unfamiliar, right? The pref is your minimum return that the investors are owed before there's really any split of the profits, right? So let's say that's 8%. But then over and above another hurdle, let's say that's 15%, then the profits are split at a, at a different rate, which is typically more favorable to the sponsor. So it's kind of think about as the deal does better, the sponsor gets a greater percentage of the, of the return um, to, comp to, to compensate them for, you know, potentially hitting a double, triple home run. So, I mean, maybe three, four years ago, an 18% tier two hurdle was pretty normal. And today, depending on what world you're in, institutional, retail, uh, depending on the deal profile, you know, 18 is still very normal. Um, I remember, uh, I don't know, three years ago, we did a deal and we did have an 18% secondary hurdle. And one of our investors said, geez, you know, that's, that's aggressive or that feels rich. And we're thinking 18%, you know, 
and and then they kind of creep down to 15 and now you're seeing tons of deals with a 13 percent tier two hurdle and uh, you know it's kind of sometimes maybe appears benign you know oh what's what's the big deal about this or what does this even do but if you plug it into your spreadsheet and compare the difference of a deal with or and without that 13 percent tier two hurdle it's a it's a big difference uh so i encourage investors to to you know just just to make sure that that looks good to them and uh that they feel that it makes sense so so that's uh, the first thing everything's coming down and the inclusion or the the, the greater um the greater use of that secondary hurdle at 13 15 18 wherever it is um the other thing is the dual tranche structure which i'm sure you're familiar with where there's a class a and a class b the class a is uh in priority in the equity position what gets a fixed rate of return of typically around nine to ten percent and then the class b members are subordinate to that equity, but they get to experience upside. So it's uh, you know a simple risk allocation, you know risk and reward allocation. And so for some investors, it's a great structure because if they're just uh, more focused on downside protection and they are more focused on current yield, they're going to love that class A at nine or ten percent. If they are less concerned about yield and okay with taking more risk. Uh, because they're, they are taking more risk because they're subordinate to that slice of equity, uh, then that's for them as well. Some, however, then there's a third group of investors that finds the structure untenable because they think it's, uh, you know, they don't like the balance, right? If they're in the class B, it's higher risk without really that much better reward. And then in the class A, they don't like the fact that they don't get upside. So for some people, it just doesn't work as a structure for them. The one thing I'll point out is while you are increasing risk because you're essentially leveraging yourself behind that class A slug of equity, it's very soft risk. It's not, you know, that class A equity is not gonna uh, foreclose out on the class B equity. There's not gonna be some sort of, you know, springing management rights and takeovers and all this. So it's, it's all very friendly le leverage. So I think of the different ways that you can lever up a deal and try to make the numbers better, it's pretty. It's a pretty safe way to go, for sure. And is your model help allocate the two tranches? Yes. I feel like that. That's probably harder for sponsors to underwrite. I guess they kind of take it on a case by case because they might have a hundred investors in a deal, but only you know ten percent take the class A level. So then you got to model that out. Um, so I guess you can't really get there until you know your allocations and what they're going to be exactly. Um, have you? How do you forecast those types of promote structures when you are presenting a deal to your right. investors? Well, that's a good point. And, and this is something that I think investors are really less aware and appreciative of, which is the, the leverage point, right? It is actually very important to but what percentage of the equity the class A versus the class B is, right? If I, if I told you that, you know, well, we're going to do 60% of the equity as class A, and then 40% is class B, the, the class A investors should be very concerned because they're taking up most of the equity. So all that purported um, downside protection that they have via the subordination of the other equity, well, there's really not that much equity that they're senior to. So what's, you know, what's the point of being in a senior position if there really isn't any equity above you? Um, so it's, it's really important as a, I would say, especially as the class A investor, that if you are giving up the upside for some purported protection, you know, you want to see it actually there. And that's why I think we haven't actually employed the dual tron structure. Uh, but from the deals that I've seen, uh, I think people are doing about 15 to 25% of the equity as class A. So I would say it's, it should be less driven by investor demand for each tranche, and it should be structured appropriately for the deal so that it really does correctly give the best of both worlds to each side. Yeah, but personally, we have not done any dual, you know, structured offerings at this time, but maybe in the future. And, but, you know, when you're investing in, in general, value-add real estate, it's called value-add for a reason. And a lot of investors want to share that upside with the sponsor. If they're just looking for a fixed rate of return, perhaps stock market is a viable alternative, potentially, if you hold it long-term enough, or, or a different type of maybe a triple net 
Walgreens that 5%, 6%, um, that'll, you know, obviously go up with rental increases in their lease agreements. So it's many different ways to, to skin the cat. So I'm glad you touched on that. How can my audience find you, Robbie? I know you mentioned, you mentioned how to find your underwriting model. How can they find you and connect with you as well? So I'm uh, very active on LinkedIn. So feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, and on, on our website, like I mentioned, you can download the model for free, check out our other resources there. And then you can also get in touch with me, uh, you know, through our invest with us form, or if you just want to, you know, reach out directly uh, via email, you can do so. My email is rob at lonestarcapgroup.com. Great. Well, Rob, thank you so much for having, thank you so much for being on the show today. Uh, if you liked what you heard and or saw, please give us a rating and review on iTunes so Rob and I can get our message out to a greater audience. And we'll have a link to uh, Rob's website as well as his underwriting model link in our social media platforms as well. So you can feel free to connect with him yourself. So thanks again for coming on, Rob. Really appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thank you.